Well, good morning and welcome to a very special Geoscience Australia Wednesday seminar. As Geoscience Australia's CEO and First Nations Australians champion, I'm pleased to welcome you to this very special seminar organised by our Reconciliation Working Group. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all of the lands across which Geoscience Australia works and the lands, in fact, that you're coming uh, to this seminar on. And for me, that's the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. And, uh, and I respect their continuing connection to country and communities uh, held by all First Nations Australians in all the lands on which Geoscience Australia works. I pay my respects to elders, past and present, and I'd like to extend that respect to any First Nations Australians joining us today. First Nations Australians are Australia's original mappers, miners and navigators. And this is the heart of the work that Geoscience Australia does. And we're committed to celebrating and learning from their many thousands of years of related knowledge. We all have a role to play to ensure that we work respectfully and collaboratively alongside traditional custodians, taking a united approach towards reconciliation. It's my great pleasure today to introduce Dan Borscher, an accomplished communicator and multi-award winning journalist with more than 20 years experience in reporting across Australia and around the world. Mr Borscher anchors ABC Canberra's 7 o'clock news and presents regularly on ABC radio and television across the country. His upbringing in Tennant Creek on the lands of the Warramungu people and his coastal Victorian Aboriginal heritage have contributed to his deep interest in the culture, history and uh, social justice issues of First Nations Australians. He's driven by giving voice to the voiceless and we're privileged to listen to Mr Borsha today as he shares with us his experiences and his views on how to be a good ally for First Nations Australians. We look forward to learning from his experience and his perspective and how we can all make the change that's within our power. And Dan is just back from the Gama Festival, so I expect we're going to hear some fresh news and, uh, and perspectives from his time there. So I now warmly welcome Dan Borsha to the podium. Uh, Yuma, good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome. It, it's so great for me to be back here on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people and to get my feet back into the soil of this ancient country that now holds a contemporary centre at the discussion about the future of Australia. And I just want to pay particular respect to Dr James Johnson as CEO for his leadership and, of course, as CEO and as the Indigenous lead here for the inclusivity that I've experienced while we've been having these discussions. I must acknowledge at first instance uh, how sorry I am at having to cancel uh, the last time that I was due to speak to you just after uh, Reconciliation Week. I came down with a lurgy and, and in spite of uh, my best intents to try and get out of, the, out of the house, my partner warned me that uh, that was in uh, no short order going to happen. So I am glad that, that uh, I'm with you now and thank you for persevering with me. I just mentioned that acknowledgement there and I, and I want to pay my respects to the Ngunnawal, the Ngambri people for their custodianship over tens of thousands of years and for that, that great respect that they have for this whole community of, of maintaining and sharing their stories with all of us. This moment here was uh, when I just with, with the help of the ABC in collaboration, where we worked with elders, some of whom are there with me at the news desk, to over 18 months co-design and work through a, a series of truth-telling about their view of the media and their experience in the media and how we as, as media practitioners could acknowledge them and, and make that connection. And now you see that every night on the screen behind me where it says Ngunnawal Country and you hear it when I say Yumra at the start of the bulletin and Yarra at the end of the news. And it was such a special privilege to be able to do the truth-telling component where we sat 
and we yarned and we talked about the way these elders perceived the media, the experiences they had. And it's so it's so important for me to ground my conversation here in that respect. And I want to echo those sentiments from Dr Johnson of acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands right across the nation, my own mum's mob from coastal Victoria, the lands that I grew up on of the Wurrumungu people, the lands of the Larrakia people where I became a journalist and, and reporting on national affairs. That respect that I have for them is what drives me and it's what keeps me going of making sure that we're telling stories that are bringing people in. It's uh, not about but with, and this has been a, a big shift in the media in, in recent years. This is my uh, late great auntie, uh, Auntie Rita, who was one of the most incredible people, women I've ever met. She grew up at a time when in Australia, she was defined as being born at midnight. It was told to her that because of the color of her skin, that she couldn't walk on the same side of the street as other kids. She was cut out of the conversation. She was isolated and separated from her friends. When she went to school, she told me that she used to eat her lunch by herself sitting in a toilet cubicle because other kids didn't want to sit with her. And she said she had to become a fighter because that was the way that she would, would get ahead and that she would grow. Later on, as a young Aboriginal woman living in Melbourne, she had said to me, well, she had to again continue to do that. And at the time, she said that she was Indian in order to get a job to be able to go and look at flats. Mind you, she also said that she wasn't allowed to go by herself because she had to have a, a man with her. And I remember talking to her and saying, Auntie, how are you not so angry and, and upset and distressed at this country? Because she had the most warm demeanor and she was so embracing and giving and sharing and, and really leaning back into those ancient characteristics that are a part of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture. She said to me, why would I? It's a bit like a rocking chair. I could do that, but what does it do? It doesn't get me anywhere. She said, on the other hand, by having conversations and by bringing this to the fore, she said, I can really help to have a conversation. And she said, it also helps that my great nephew has a role in the media. And, and I was thinking about her when I was at the Gama Festival just over the weekend, and I, I had a front row seat to history being written, and I thought to myself, I wonder what Aunty Rita would say, that her nephew, her great nephew, was standing there talking about the contemporary issues in Australia as we led into an announcement by the Prime Minister that I'll get to in a moment. And I thought, I know what she would have thought because she's with me. She's always with me. She's that part of my conscience. She's part of my psyche, my zeitgeist. She's one of the, the elders that's in the back of my head when I'm making decisions and thinking about what are the implications of this? What does this mean? What does this look like? And she did everything with great humility. It's such a lesson for me and, and for my generation to listen more, pause more often, think deeply about what we're doing, the decisions that we're making. And on that note, I do want to open up to questions uh, very soon. So I want to make sure that there's plenty of time for us to be able to have a yarn. And just on that note, I want, I want you to be able to ask whatever questions it is that you are thinking about the thing that you want to know about because we can't do truth telling if we can't have tough conversations if we can't recognize that there are parts of our history that we need to lean into that are going to be tough that are going to be quite difficult so i want to open that up to all of you i grew up on the lands of the warramungu country and i guess it's fair to say that i was drawn to journalism quite early. At, at about 13, I was the window cleaner of the Tenant and District Times. And throughout that time, the editor, Jasmine Afianos, would see me and she would be looking at, at what I was doing and how I was doing. And she said to me that she always saw there was a great thirst, a great energy and in desire to be telling the stories. And so she put me through a cadetship and, and helped to grow me, to start shaping me. But for me, it was always about the storytelling and it still is now. It's about being able to have a yarn, to build a trust and respect, to have a conversation that brings people together, that does address and look and leans into tough conversations, but does it in a way that doesn't say, well, you're right or wrong. We have different perspectives. We have 
different points of view. I do worry that in the media and in, in public life that we're losing that ability to politely disagree, that you and I might not have the same position, we might not have the same view on something, but just because of that doesn't mean that we have to hate each other or dislike each other. We can actually agree to disagree. And I hope that in the discussion that we're going to see over the, the next months and years around a referendum of enshrining a voice to Parliament, that we just all keep in mind that great generosity from the elders. Uh, and I want to uh, jump in here and add, uh, without slides, I just want to talk about the comments that the Prime Minister made at the Gama Festival on that ancient Yolnu country just a couple of days ago. Uh, and, and I want to bring in that point that Dr Johnson mentioned about First Nations pe people being the first geologists, the first miners, the first carers of country. And it struck me while I was up there at Gulkala on that incredible escarpment with the, the deep red soil on the bauxite in the ground, that, that this is in part how we have these conversations, that, that we are talking about nation groups that have been here for tens of thousands of years, that the cultural ceremony that welcomed the Prime Minister into that land was one that has been used on that soil for more than 60 to 80,000 years. It's been one that's evolved over time, that has shifted, as of course culture does, but is one that connects to the past but also looks to the future. The Prime Minister spoke quite passionately there at Gulkala and he said, if not now, when? If not now, when? And it's such a simple phrase, but so poignant as he was leading into this conversation about the wording that would be put to all of us, to you and to I, to everyone that's joining us this morning about what sort of a country do we want to become? And is that one where we acknowledge that ancient connection in our founding document, the document that sets the rules, the parameters for our society. And how do we go about doing that? The Prime Minister suggested a sequence of words that he believed would be the ones that, that should go into the Constitution, but also acknowledging that they are open to change. And when the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, spoke about that, he spoke about hope and humility and that, that hope that, that things can be done differently, acknowledging that in the past there have been failures of policy, that there have been missteps, misfires, misstarts, and that this is a chance to once and for all say, right, we are moving forward. We are going to have this body that we, the details of which are yet to be discussed, but that would connect you if you're on Yolongo country or if you're on Waramungu land in Tennant Creek or Gunjumara land in Warrnambool, where my mum's mob are from, that they, those voices would connect directly to the parliament not far from where I'm standing here on Ngunnawal country. And that that would be the point that without the filters of party politics and without the constitution, the, the constituencies that polit other politicians have in parliament, that that actually creates an opportunity for more voices rather than fewer. And it was asked to me uh, just yesterday on a radio program I was speaking on about the fact that we now have 11 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in our federal parliament from across this nation, from all walks of life, from all political parties, including an independent. Someone said, isn't that an indication that we don't need a voice? And I said, well, actually, it feels to me that that's an indication that we are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are finding a rightful place in Parliament. But a voice is a value add. It doesn't diminish their voices, it adds to them. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever had conversations and yarns, the more people that are involved, the greater the level of, of expertise and experience, the better, because we can't have brilliant and amazing outcomes if we're cutting people out of the conversation. And even though we are seeing more and more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the parliament, that they have to go through a filter of party politics, which are often binding and mean that some things just aren't going to get heard. And those voices are not going to get into the discussion. So uh, that's where I see the voice as being an opportunity to do that. I do acknowledge that we are going to be having big conversations in this, uh, the years ahead. And I think it's really important to note that there are going to be times that this is a really, really tough conversation. And I just hope that we all come at it with such 
generosity and goodwill and, and respect for each other because we have so few opportunities to do nation building, to bring people together, to be able to have these, these sorts of debates. And I'm, I'm so hoping that that's exactly where we're going into this discussion. Uh, as, as you heard from Dr Johnson, I began in Tennant Creek in my media career and have been really fortunate to work uh, across Australia and around the world for, for three networks and two newspapers. Uh, and I've been able to have conversations that are about some of the really challenging uh, issues and areas. I mean, uh, some of the highs we're interviewing there in that top left hand corner, Mat Marty Natalagawa, who was then the Foreign Minister of Indonesia. And I got an, a number of interview to opportunities to interview him and to speak to him about relationships between Australia and Indonesia. And he was the one that on the sidelines of the Davos Forum, I think it was in 2013, said it was a very unfriendly act that Australia had turned back boats to Indonesia. And to most people, that terminology might seem fairly innocuous. But when it comes to the discussion about diplomacy, that was actually quite a serious thing for him to say, there's a story there, a photo there rather with me, with a number of children where that was a, a story about eradicating trachoma, which is now back in the news just in the last couple of days, a, a really crippling eye condition that doesn't exist anywhere in the developed world. It's something that's only in the developing world, except in Australia, in remote indigenous communities. And it says something about the, the place and the, the role of politics and policy right now. And there have been other opportunities where to, to tell stories about the really amazing things, about incredible successes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and about how we navigate those. There have also been lots of really tough stories that I've covered. There have been uh, those about the Royal Commission into Aboriginal, uh, into institutional responses to child sexual abuse and hearing the really horrible and, and heartbreaking detail that came out of there or the, the death in Indonesia on Chilichap Island, which is dubbed there by the locals as being Death Island of Andrew Chan and Maren Sukumaran, uh, who were a part of the so-called Bali Nine who were executed along with a number of other people from around the world. And I can remember doing an interview with their mums the next day and just feeling utterly devastated about the state of our world and about how it seemed to me that, that these Australians that had been locked up for such a long time were caught up in a political discussion uh, not long after Joko, Joko Widodo, known as Jokowi in Indonesia, had won that election and the criticism of him was that he wasn't a strong man and that how would he bring the country together? And one of his first acts was to show, well, in fact, that he was a strong man and that he wasn't afraid to challenge the, that which had been said uh, about him. So there have been a number of, of highs and lows one of the things that I really love about my role now is about being able to bring community together, about talking to school groups and to community groups and to organisations like yours here at Geoscience Australia about my journey and some of my perspectives and views on where we are as a country and where we're going. And I particularly love doing that with, with children because I think there's such an opportunity to be able to have that conversation, I tell you what, the questions that children ask are always uh, the ones that make, make you a bit nervous. I was speaking uh, not long ago to Tilopia Primary uh, Senior School and a group of year eight students were peppering me about trust in media, about ethics, about values, media consumption, social media, racism online, about trust in our democratic institutions. And I felt both uh, challenged about some of the questions and about how to respond to them in a respectful way while also staying in my lane, that these are not necessarily all the areas that I am an expert at communicating, though, is one of them for me. But also I felt so optimistic about the state of the future, that we have these incredible young people who are leaning forward, who are having big conversations, that are taking opportunities to ask anyone the questions that they want to know about and I love talking to them about not being dissuaded 
from your dreams, about following those and about dealing with challenges in ways that are about respect along the way, because those are lessons that I've learnt along the way as well. And I think it's so important that we, that we chase our dreams, that we bring people together, that we are inclusive. And part of that is about celebrating success. And, and, and so I've got this whole policy now that when I come across amazing people, particularly amazing Indigenous women, I nominate them for awards for Orders of Australia, if that's what uh, the level of success is, or Australian of the Year awards, or NAIDOC awards. And I think this is something that we can all do because we always get to January 26th or the Queen's birthday and look at the lists of those awards and say, well, where are all of the women? There has been a big debate. Where are the First Nations people? Where are the people of diversity? And I remember uh, lamenting that with some friends at one point and they said, well, why don't you just start nominating? And it's the simplest thing in the world, isn't it? That if you see someone who's doing something amazing in your community, nominate them. Because it, even if, the, if it's not successful, when they're told about it, what an honour to know that someone's taken the time to put down in paper, on paper what you can do, what you're about, who you are, what your successes are, the, the value that you bring. And quite often, this is the thing I find in, in so many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities as I'm travelling around, is that people, are, they're so shocked and surprised that someone took that time because I remember speaking to Annie Rosemary in Tennant Creek, was saying she didn't feel as though she'd done anything to deserve being, being honoured with an Order of Australia. But whoever nominated her, I didn't nominate her, but whoever did saw that, saw what she was doing, nominated it, a whole panel of very important people decided that that was the case. What a way of building community and what a way of focusing on the positives and about bringing people together. And I think part of that for me is about that, that allyship, is about having conversations and, and creating an environment where you can have a respectful conversation and about asking questions that are important. It's about supporting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And, and if you're in a team or a group of people and you don't have Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander expertise there, I think the question that we need to be asking is why, and that's not an attack. Part of this is just about saying, well, right, what is our organisational structure? How do we operate? Are we inclusive and engaging? And do we do inclusion, diversity? And the third part that I think often gets missed, and that's around belonging. Are we creating that environment? And are we making this a place where those that expertise is valued and is appreciated? And is it just all falling on one person? Because there's a whole debate happening nationally right now about cultural load and about how we ensure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people aren't being burnt out because they might be the only person within that team who then is asked every question and deals with every single situation. And for a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, I'm sure that they at sometimes feel the sense that I feel of a bit of imposter syndrome, that you, you think, am I the best person to be here. Did I get this just because of, of that horrible notion of ticking a box? And it, it can be really pervasive and really challenging. And it's something that I was just talking to uh, one of my uh, friends and colleagues, Bridget Brennan, a Yorta Yorta woman who's a, a fabulous journal at the ABC, who's been a foreign correspondent and is the Indigenous Affairs Editor now. And, and she was telling me, you know, that we've got to make sure that we challenge that sense of imposter syndrome by staring it on and taking it on head on. And I think that's, that's really important. And allyship is about building relationships because ultimately everything comes back to relationships, doesn't it? Trust is built out of relationships. It's about bringing people together, about having spaces where we have conversations like this. And it's why I think it's so important to be having these conversations. And I think it's important to be tackling that sense of imposter syndrome. And a big part of that is also that point around elevating voices. And, and I try and do that wherever I can in the media, here at the National Museum of Australia. At the launch of the Songlines exhibition, there was I managed to have this 
incredible panel of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, all Indigenous, talking about that issue or that story around the Songlines exhibition, but also having a broader conversation about how we do those conversations going forward. And it's so, so important to be doing that about creating the spaces and creating those environments where we can have that conversation. Uh, the, the discussion around governance is one that pops up so often, and this was at the Gama Festival a couple of years ago, where I was asked to chair a panel on uh, governance and that link between First Nations governance and a broader Australian governance right now. And there are lots of synergies there, but there are also lots of learnings that, that corporate, media, business, government departments can learn from in First Nations governance of that, that point about sitting and thinking deeply. Dadiri is what it's called up in parts of the Northern Territory where you stop and really deeply listen. And that's as much a message for media and journalists and professionals like myself as it is for anyone that we need to be taking more time to do that listening. But there is that, that strong parallel between governance because when you think about it, we've had Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been managing this land and this country for tens of thousands of years. More than 250 uh, nation groups uh, still with connections in one way or another. Many of them though, sadly have, go, have gone dormant and some have been lost altogether. But we've had for such a long time, tens of thousands of years, governance structures, really nuanced and detailed ways of looking at leadership in our community, at, at eldership, of mentoring, of growing younger people. And it's so important to be able to, to connect with that. And it's why I've really enjoyed leaning into the governance space of, of sitting on boards and of bringing uh, that different perspective. But it's the same at the board table. You know, if you have, there's a, there is a, rightly a big discussion about gender equity on, in governance in Australia right now. And it was one that was about parliament at the last election. And mind you, Australians voted overwhelmingly to make this the most diverse parliament we've ever seen. And there is, you know, that is an incredible success and, and that needs to be celebrated that the voices that are in the house, not far from this place that I'm coming to you from this morning, are so diverse. I have such a different lived experience, come from such different backgrounds. That can only mean that there are going to be different inputs and perspectives brought to all of those conversations. And of course, there is still work to do, but we can't not celebrate and acknowledge where we are right now. And that's why I think that the, the voice to Parliament is really about value adding to that and about bringing in more and more perspectives. But it's the same challenge that boards, governance boards are facing because there was a time uh, and I think there are still some boards on the ASX that have no women on their boards. And I just think that is is astounding in 2022 that, that you just wouldn't have people that are different at the board table. Because how can you possibly hope to look at issues with a different lens if you've all got the same pair of glasses on and, you, and come from very similar backgrounds? And that's not to say that there needs to be a, a, a mass move away from people that are on boards because you actually need, it needs to be a process of transition, doesn't it? Where you're passing on that expertise and mentoring and growing people that are different, that haven't historically been invited to the table. And when we see that, when we see that inclusion, then we start to see difference. And I remember that when the uh, Rio Tinto's devastating destruction of the Duke and Gorge of the PKKP people up in the far north of Western Australia happened, there was a rightful devastation, but it actually hurt. It hurt to see that artwork that was tens of thousands of years old, that was in, in some, uh, some of those pieces were being painted and those stories told at the same time as the pyramids were being built. And could you imagine if Rio went and blew up one of the pyramids, what would happen? You would hope that it wouldn't happen, but then there was an expectation that that ancient land wouldn't be destroyed for monetary gain. But sadly, successive people in the chain of command, including the board of directors, signed off on that and they thought that was acceptable. Mind you, there are still questions about the, the West Australian government 
involvement in some of the agreements and the, the land use about that. But that ties in so powerfully to the work that you all do here at Geoscience because it's about our earth and it's about our land and how we protect and maintain and that delicate balance of extracting minerals and understanding the earth that's beneath our feet, but also protecting and preserving it. And it's why I think that Geoscience Australia has such a key role in this big conversation. And I think it, 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 there is a lot for companies like Rio Tinto, such as Rio Tinto, to learn from Geoscience Australia, from that ancient knowledge and from the knowledge that comes from the first peoples of that land. I remember asking Ian Ham, who is a respected company director, an indigenous man who is deeply connected to uh, so many different boards and companies. I asked him when he was at the National Press Club, do you think that that would have happened at Rio if there are Aboriginal people on the board? And he said, no because there would have been a different lens and there would have been a different conversation that said actually we need to include this perspective and we need to make sure that we are thinking about what the damage will be along the way and you would hope that they've learnt that lesson and certainly having Ben Wyatt, the former treasurer of Western Australia on the board is important but again this doesn't just fall to one person and this is a, an opportunity for companies now like Rio Tinto to have a really deep look at themselves and their structures and and actually ask themselves the question do they value Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives and if the answer is yes then things need to change and if it's no then the question for the rest of Australia is what happens to their social license and is this a company that you can support or that, in fact, people need to then say, well, we are not going to deal with that. We're not going to tolerate that anymore. And, and in, in line with this bigger discussion about the voice, I think we're getting to a point where companies, big and small corporations, government departments, governments themselves are being told that we are not going to accept the status quo any longer, that there is, it is time for change and that there is a groundswell of discussion about how, just how we do that. Some of the lessons that I've learned throughout my career that I think uh, tie in perfectly with the discussion about allyship that Dr Johnson touched on a little earlier are about admitting when you're wrong and learning from that. And that's not necessarily uh, one that comes from the Indigenous community, that's me as a journalist. And that's a hard lesson to, to be humble when you make a mistake, to apologise and to seek to find out why and to move on from there. I think about asking for help, that, that we are almost intrinsically designed not to ask for help. And I think that's a big problem and one that we need to deal with. We need to say, actually, I don't have all the answers and I need to get this expertise. I think we have a, a, a real challenge in Australia about, like there's a whole thing about the t tall poppy syndrome, isn't there? But I think we actually have a, a bigger problem about giving praise and accepting praise. And, and I've, I saw that in Gama with myself and so many of my colleagues would get congratulated for the work we'd do. And our instinctive response is, oh, yeah, but it was, I was just doing my job and I was getting on with it. Or one of my colleagues said to me, I, I feel quite uncomfortable people saying thank you. And I think that part of it is that we all have to get used to that and be, be doing that more regularly and, and giving praise uh, along the way. I think the other thing is around regrets. Don't, don't give regrets. Give things a go, even if it seems impossible, because that's probably even more important. We are facing uh, many, many hurdles right now. Trust is, is such an incredible one. For us in the media, uh, I think we are seeing more and more how hard it is to earn and how easy it is to lose. And I want to go, I go to the uh, Edelman Trust Barometer that shows that there is 31% trust in Australian media as of 2018. Only Turkey was lower than that in terms of trust at 30%. That's a real issue. The fact that Australians are overwhelmingly not trusting the media means that we have got a lot of work to do. And I think that that's the case as well for so many different areas of our society. And I think that, that there are lots of lessons to that do. I think mentoring is something that we need to be working on more in the media across industries. And that's something that uh, I've experienced my whole life as a journalist from other journalists. Stan Grant is one of my close friends, confidants and mentor who I speak to regularly about 
challenges that I'm facing. And Bridget Brennan, even though we're the same age and similar experience, we were just talking about this, how we feel like we kind of offer mentorship to each other. But it's certainly important for that to be the case for younger journalists as well. And, and it's not just in media, is it? This is in your industry that, that mentoring younger people that don't have the skills that you have is a way of building them up, but it's also a way of passing on your skills. And part of that is about our legacy as humankind, about the experience that we share. And I, I want to take you to uh, something that I experienced firsthand at, at Gama and that I've experienced throughout my life, and that's about the generosity of elders that, that bring us all in and share those stories. And, and that's what the elders did when they partnered with the ABC for that acknowledgement to country. And it's what I saw when we see those dancers at into the bungal on that land at Yolngu country up in uh, the Gumach lands there of the, the Northern Territory, that that's about sharing that ancient culture and it's about bringing everyone in and making sure that the Prime Minister, and that's happened for successive Prime Ministers of all stripes, that it's about respect and it's about building that environment. And I think that's so, so very crucial because that's something that we can all do. We can all be doing mentoring. We can all be bringing people in and giving people a chance, particularly if, if the, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and that they're not a part of your team right now, then this is the opportunity where, where you have a chance to be able to really change that. There, there's a, an observation that, uh, that I've made that in our country, it's people, community and companies that are changing the way we do things. We, we saw that in this, the whole momentum from the Uluru Statement from the Heart five years ago to the announcement by the Prime Minister on the weekend that there will be a process towards a referendum for a voice. We now have a, a, a set of words that we will all be asked to vote on if those ones are accepted by the parliament and we have a set of words that could possibly go into the constitution. But we also saw that, didn't we, in the, in the wake of the Duke and Gorge tragedy, in the way that the community responded to Rio Tinto and the impact that that had on them as a company. We saw it around the discussion of the plebiscite for same-sex marriage. We saw that in marriage equality there and how the community, companies and people said, actually, we want to do things differently. We want to be inclusive. Another observation is about the power of every voice and every story matters. And this is where we can, the more that we do the deep listening and, and, and sit down and create the environments to have a yarn and to have a conversation, the better we will be because the greater our depth of knowledge will be. I think that we are in a, a phase of learning to live with COVID-19. And this last couple of years, I acknowledge, has been incredibly tough for so many people and has been one of disconnection of, in some instances, of people feeling like they've been left behind. And I think that's a real tragedy and something that we need to be thinking about as a society. It's also highlighted the great disparity in our country and about the difference be between those who are doing well and were able to perhaps go to a beach home and those who don't have a home at all. And I was just talking to someone the other day about uh, this concept of, of the working poor. And I, I heard David Pocock, the new independent senator, say it in his first speech to parliament last night about the working homeless. And this is a story that I've covered over the years of particularly women that are working have perhaps come out of a marriage after being out of the workforce for a long time and have had to, even though with tremendous skills, have had to start at the bottom of the, the rung, the last rung on the ladder and work their way up. And, and you have incredibly talented women doing important jobs living in their cars. This is, a, this is something we hear about the burnout factor of teachers and our educators and those that are working in our hospitals on the front line of navigating the COVID-19 pandemic. These are all big challenges that we need to grapple with as a country. And we have the solutions. We just need to have the conversations and have that mutual respect to get towards them. My call to action to you today is one that, that came in both parts around NAIDOC week, but also from Reconciliation Week, and that is get up, stand up, show up for, for NAIDOC week. And I think that's so important because 
That is an invitation to all Australians, isn't it? It's for all of us to do our part. We can do that through an acknowledgement. And for anyone who's not familiar with or just why that is important, basically it's that I wouldn't come to your house and just walk in the door, would I? I would knock on the door. You can see that as being akin to an acknowledgement. You opening the door and welcoming me into your land, to your home, to your country. Well, that's the welcome part. And that's what we do for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, that I wouldn't do a welcome because this is not my country. This is not the land that I'm deeply connected to, but I will do an acknowledgement because it's important for me to respect the people whose land that I'm on. And it's up to the, the local landowners, the custodians, to do that welcome because it's their land and they're bringing us in. The, the point about learning, this all ties into allyship, about having conversations like this one. And I'm hoping that this is just the first that you have or the next one that you have in this discussion, not the last, because we've all got to have conversations. And the more that we sit together and yarn and learn, the greater that we will, will become and the more powerful we become because we understand each other. Supporting one another and celebrating difference is so crucial. Calling out bigotry and, and racism, it's often called now microaggressions or um, passive racism. I think that we need to be really careful about language and we need to have a, a way of saying, do you know what, that's not cool, that's not okay. Let's have a conversation about the why. We've got to be really careful not to alienate people, but also be quite firm as well. The point I made earlier about who's at the table, who has a seat, whose voices are being listened to. We need to make sure that we're creating spaces at the table for everyone to have a voice, for there to be so many different perspectives there. The point about belonging is one I think that often gets missed out in the diversity and inclusion discussion. That's making sure that you're creating an environment where people feel valued and respected and included and part of that. And also, this is a discussion all year round, isn't it? I mean, the fact that we're having this in August, just after the Garma Festival, that was about looking to the future, is so important because this is not a conversation we just have in NAIDOC week or in Reconciliation Week. This is a conversation we need to have every day, all the time, in an ongoing way that is about bringing people together. Um, and I just want to want to say thank you so much for for sticking with me and for for listening to me. It, uh, I always find it really hard to to um, have these longer conversations just down the barrel. So I hope that I've been engaging and and brought you in. And I'm really really keen for your questions. And uh, I just want to pass on my. Uh, my respect again to Dr. Johnson, to the team here for bringing me in and having this conversation. And I do hope that you've gained something from it. Uh, I'm going to pass over to Amy now. We're going to have a bit of a, a yarn about your questions, but thank you. Thank you so much.